Let's talk about Mars. Not the sanitized NASA brochure version, the raw, unfiltered truth about that rusty death ball next door. Because here's what nobody's telling you. Mars isn't just inhospitable. It's laughing at us. Think about it. We've spent decades and billions sending robots to crawl across its corpse-like surface, drilling into its fossilized riverbeds like cosmic forensic investigators. And what have we learned? That Mars didn't just die, it committed planetary suicide. This place makes the Sahara look like a beach resort, a frigid desert where temperatures swing from almost pleasant 68 degrees Fahrenheit at noon to instant freezer burn, negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at night. A year lasts 687 days of this nonsense, nearly twice as long as Earth's, while a day teasingly lasts just 40 minutes longer than ours. Cruel joke, really. The gravity is just 38% of Earth's. You could jump three times higher, but good luck keeping your bones from turning to brittle chalk after a few months. Why gravity matters? That 62% weaker gravity isn't just fun for jumping. It's a slow motion body horror experiment. Astronauts on the ISS lose one to 2% of bone density per month. On Mars, you're looking at muscle atrophy, fluid redistribution, hello, puffy face, and possibly irreversible organ damage after a few years. Future colonists might return to Earth as feeble, hunched creatures. If they return at all, the atmosphere, gone. Ripped away by solar winds when Mars's magnetic field collapsed like a bad souffle. What remains is a CO2-filled death blanket so thin it makes Mount Everest's peak feel like sea level. The water, either frozen underground or evaporated into space like tears in a hurricane. What remains is a freeze-dried wasteland where the dirt is literally poisonous. Thanks, perchlorates. Now, about those apocalyptic dust storms. Mars doesn't do weather. It does punishment. Imagine a hurricane the size of North America that lasts for months, with winds screaming at 60 miles per hour. But here's the kicker. The atmosphere's so thin, those winds feel like a weak breeze. Yet the dust is so fine, it blots out the sun globally coating solar panels and lungs in a fine radioactive powder. NASA's Opportunity rover literally died in one of these storms. A machine built by engineers. Gone. But here's where it gets interesting. While NASA plays it safe with their follow the water mantra, the real story is written in the planet's scars. Olympus Mons isn't just a volcano. It's a geological scream frozen in time, a 13 miles tall middle finger to Earth's puny mountains. The Vales Marineris? That's not a canyon. It's the mother of all stretch marks from when Mars lost its atmospheric baby weight, stretching 2,500 miles across its emaciated surface. The Face on Mars Conspiracy. Back in 1976, NASA's Viking 1 orbiter snapped a photo of the Cydonia region showing what looked like a 1.2-mile-long humanoid face, staring blankly into space. Cue the conspiracy theories. Ancient alien monument, said every ufologist. Secret Martian civilization, shouted late-night radio hosts. NASA cover-up. The truth? It's a beaut. Higher resolution images proved it's just a trick of light and shadow on a weathered mesa. But admit it. You wanted it to be aliens. We all did. That's Mars for you. Even its hoaxes are more interesting than reality. Discovery interlude. Humans have spotted Mars since forever. Our ancestors called it the Blood Star, naming it after their war gods. But the real T? Galileo was first to peek at it through a telescope in 1609, seeing absolutely nothing interesting. The drama started in 1877 when Giovanni Schiaparelli discovered canals and Percival Lowell ran with it, convincing the world Martians were building waterways. Classic case of cosmic miscommunication. And then there's Elon Musk standing there with his starship blueprints like a cosmic real estate developer. Ocean view properties, he promises, while conveniently forgetting to mention the ocean evaporated three billion years ago. His plan? Basically a high-tech version of building igloos in hell, pressurized domes, underground tunnels, and enough nuclear reactors to make a Greenpeace activist faint. But hold on. Before you start packing your pressurized bags for Musk's Martian timeshare, 
let's talk about the ultimate cosmic fixer-upper project, terraforming. Yeah, that sci-fi wet dream of turning this freeze-dried hellscape into Earth 2.0. The audacity alone deserves a slow clap. Imagine it, planetary scale plastic surgery. Step one, thicken that pathetic atmosphere currently offering less protection than wet tissue paper. How? Maybe nuke the poles. Seriously, some proposals suggest it. To vaporize frozen CO2, or crash ice-laden asteroids into the surface like cosmic water balloons. Release genetically engineered super bacteria to fart out oxygen and nitrogen for millennia. We're talking about trying to fill an ocean with an eyedropper. Only the ocean is planetary, and the eyedropper is all of human technology strapped to a rocket. Then there's the magnetic field problem, or lack thereof. Remember that bad souffle? Without it, solar winds will just strip away your shiny new atmosphere all over again. Solution? Maybe build an artificial magnet the size of Texas parked at Mars Sun L1 point, guzzling more power than our entire civilization produces. Simple, right? Just a little stellar scale engineering project while you wait for the algae to photosynthesize. And the dirt? Oh, the perchlorates. Those nasty salts making the regolith a toxic playground. You can't just plant some daisies and call it home. You'd need armies of nanobots scrubbing every grain or dumping mountains of imported soil just to grow a potato without it glowing. Forget the Martian. Think the chemist, permanently suited up in a hazmat onesie. The timescales? Optimists whisper centuries. Realists mutter millennia. Pessimists laugh into the void. We're talking about generations living and dying in tin cans, pouring resources into a project with more unknowns than a black hole's laundry list, all while Earth might be busy imploding anyway. It's the ultimate pyramid scheme, built on Martian sand. So why even whisper the word terraforming? Because it's the ultimate expression of that human insanity we were talking about. It's not just surviving Mars, it's conquering it, erasing its death rattle history and forcing it to breathe again. It's playing God on a scale that makes Olympus Mons look like a pimple. And deep down, in that stubborn, suicidal, glorious part of our monkey brains, the idea of remaking a world, even one actively laughing at us, is the most intoxicating, dangerous, hubristic drug imaginable. Faint. But here's the kicker. We're still going. Because Mars isn't just a planet. It's a mirror. When we look at those dead river valleys, we're seeing Earth's potential future. When we study its atmospheric collapse, we're reading our own obituary. That's why we can't look away. Why we'll keep sending robots, then people, then probably corpses when things go wrong. The real question isn't, can we survive on Mars? It's, why does this dead world haunt us so badly? Maybe because deep down, we know it's not just another planet. It's a warning, a time capsule, a cosmic morgue photo showing what happens when a world loses its life support systems. So are we explorers, colonists, or just cosmic rubberneckers drawn to the biggest planetary car wreck in the solar system? Yet we'll still go, because Mars is the ultimate bad idea we can't resist. Like a toxic X or a third tequila shot. It's not a planet. It's a Rorschach test for human insanity. Drop your thoughts below. And if you think I'm being too harsh on our rusty neighbor, just wait until we talk about Venus. Now there's a real hellscape. Smash that like button if you'd still book a one-way ticket to Mars. Subscribe for more unfiltered cosmic truth bombs.